Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Michael Lesky. I'm a software engineer at VMware based out of uh, Santa Monica, California. I'm Aaron Lindsay. I'm an Apache geocommitter and engineer at VMware. I'm based in Oregon in the United States. And today we're going to talk to you about uh, running Apache Geode on Kubernetes, or as uh, I have called it much to Aaron's chagrin, it's Kubernetes Geode time. So let's uh, let's dive into the outline and see what we'll talk about today. So uh, we got a pretty pretty short outline looks here, but there's a lot of depth in here. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, motivation. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of Geode and Kubernetes. We're going to talk about what a Kubernetes operator is. Uh, then we'll dive into uh, what building that the solution uh, looked like, and then uh, a summary. So. Um, you know, at VMware, we've been working on making uh, uh, Geode work on Kubernetes. Um, and we hope after this talk, you'll be able to apply some of these lessons if you are trying to run Geode on Kubernetes. So let's dive into some motivation here. So why Geode? Well, Geode's a low latency, high concurrency, concurrency data management solution. Uh, so if you attended any of the wonderful talks yesterday, you would have heard a little bit more about um, how how Geode works itself, but it's very, very good at these fast data transactions. And so why containers? Why would I consider running Geode in a container? Well, um, containers abstract from the operating system. So this abstraction means we no longer have to think about the operating system piece on virtualized hardware. We just have the operating system with our logical resources. Um, we can also decouple the application from the infrastructure. So uh, normally when you deploy an application, um, say Geo, you have to think about what the infrastructure is you're running on. You got to make sure it's all set up and all uh, has all the required pieces that you need. Uh, in Geo's case, you need Java. Um, and so in containers, we can just say, oh, I'm going to make sure my container has all the pieces I need to run Geo. Um, and then I'm just going to look for some infrastructure that can run containers. I don't really care what it is. I just, it just needs to say I can run containers. Uh, and then consistent deploys. So uh, the neat thing about being in a container is that uh, it has all the pieces we need to run and knows exactly how to run it. And so when I uh, need a new deployment, I already have all the pieces needed to run it the same way as I did the first time I ran it. It's all in the container. And so uh, I don't need to configure the infrastructure. I just say, here's my container, please run it. So yeah, that sounds really cool and awesome and all that. So why Kubernetes? Well, um, Kubernetes is a tool that allows for those easy configuration deployment and management uh, and scaling events. And so um, you have your container, but you got to still do things with your container, such as like, I want multiple copies of this container running. So in the case of a geode server, we probably want more than one server. Um, and so this, uh, this tool, Kubernetes, will allow us to just deploy easily more containers in the same way instead of us having to manually deploy containers. Uh, Service discovery and load balancing is another important part of Kubernetes. So great, I got all these containers running. They need to talk to each other. And so what Kubernetes provides is it provides both service discovery, so applications I want to consume, Geode, have an easy way to find it, and load balancing, so there's an easy way to route to the multiple copies of your container that you have. Um, so you basically don't have to do all the, DN, uh, the networking yourself. Uh, Recovery is another important piece for, for Kubernetes. This is the ability to restart containers. So if, if something bad happens, if the container um, starts to crash, uh, Kubernetes will recognize that and go replace uh, the container. And more importantly, it won't tell other uh, pieces of your system that the container is ready until it truly is ready. Um, and then lastly, running Geode near applications. So 
uh, we've been hearing more and more from customers about how they're either currently moving to Kubernetes or they're looking to move to Kubernetes and uh, they would like to have Geode available near those uh, uh, those applications that they run. Just uh, it makes it easier to have folks communicate with their Geode cluster if they're both on Kubernetes for them. So with that motivation in mind, um, why don't we dive into some of the challenges, Aaron? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so at this point, you might be wondering, well, that sounds like a great idea, Geode on Kubernetes. So can't we just take Geode, put it in some Docker containers and deploy it and be done? Um, well, it turns out it's not quite that straightforward. So I'm going to discuss some of the challenges of running Geode on Kubernetes. So the first thing that I have listed here is operating a Geo cluster requires specialized knowledge. To explain this, I want to give a quick example. So suppose that I am in charge of operating a production geode cluster, and I wanna upgrade from one geode version to the next. There are quite a few steps I need to go through to make sure that this is successful. So first of all, I would need to know that there are two different kinds of processes in geode. Some are locators, some are servers. And I would need to know that I need to upgrade the locators before the servers. Another thing is that I would need to make sure that before I upgraded any of the servers, um, I need to make sure the in-memory data on that server is replicated to at least one other server. Otherwise, I would lose that data. So these are some of these examples of specialized knowledge that a human operator would need to know in order to operate a geo cluster. And this might sound obvious, but Kubernetes doesn't know any of that stuff. Like Kubernetes by default doesn't know about geode. It doesn't know about geode special requirements. Um, so we kind of need a way to encode some of that application specific knowledge into Kubernetes. The second thing listed here is geode was not primarily designed to run in a cloud environment. Now this certainly doesn't mean you can't run it in a cloud environment, but when you look at where geode is traditionally deployed, um, you notice that there's usually more of a static network. So um, by contrast, in Kubernetes, IP addresses um, don't get assigned to the pods until they start. And um, each, each Geode member, when it restarts, it'll receive a new IP address. So this kind of dynamic network is uh, kind of a new environment for Geode. And we'll see that we do run into some challenges when we try to run Geode there. So the last thing here is running stateful applications on Kubernetes requires great care. What I mean by this is usually uh, with stateful applications, we have some data and we need to make sure we don't lose that data. Um, oftentimes stateful apps have some sort of consensus mechanism and you don't wanna get in a state where you have a network partition and you have the split brain scenario where two, uh, two or more halves of the system are operating independently. So you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so that will be another challenge that we have to deal with. Um, so with those challenges in mind, um, let's talk about the idea of a Kubernetes operator. Uh, Kubernetes operator is a pattern for extending Kubernetes to manage complex stateful applications. An operator is usually composed of two things. So first of all, you have a set of custom resource definitions or CRDs. And these are custom Kubernetes types that represent some sort of domain specific schema. So for example, you might have a CRD called a geo cluster and the schema would include things like the number of locators, number of servers, et cetera. The second thing in the operator is a custom controller this is the part that encodes that application specific knowledge we talked about earlier and implements what's known as desired state management. So desired state management is kind of this idea at the core of Kubernetes where um, I, as a user, I declare some desired state that I want the system to be in and it's up to Kubernetes to make it happen. And the controller is the component that is going to actually implement this desired state management. 
The next thing I want to do is just walk through a quick example of how we can use a Kubernetes operator to deploy a geo cluster. On the screen here, I have a, a Kubernetes cluster with three worker nodes on the right and a set of control plane nodes in the center. The first step is to deploy the operator itself. Um, so we do that using a YAML file and uh, the YAML file has a lot of stuff in it, but I just, I'm focusing on two parts here. So uh, the first part is a deployment. Um, a, de a deployment in Kubernetes is just a set of one or more identical pods. And a pod in Kubernetes is kind of like a set of containers or processes. In this case, um, for this example, a pod is just a single geode process. So um, for this deployment, it is for the controller and we see that it has one replica. So I'm just deploying one controller pod. The second thing in this YAML file is the custom resource definition that we talked about earlier. So this is defining a kind in Kubernetes called geode cluster. And kind is like a custom type. So we give this to the Kubernetes API and the control plane will spin up the locator pod that we asked for. The first thing the controller does when it starts is it creates what's called a watch on GeoCluster. So a watch is kind of like a subscription for events. So this is saying, hey, Kubernetes API, tell me anytime somebody creates, updates, or deletes a GeoCluster. Great, so now the operator is fully deployed. So the next step is to deploy our GeoCluster. Um, so that you see at the bottom here is an example of defining a GeoCluster in YAML and this, uh, just right now, it just has a few fields. So we're saying, uh, we're asking for three locator replicas and three server replicas. So we give that to the Kubernetes API and now the API understands what a geo cluster is because we've defined that type. And so now the controller receives an event because we've created a geo cluster. At this point, the controller is doing its desired state management where it's gonna look at the current state of the system and notice that there are no locators or servers, but we asked for three locators and three servers. So the controller, the first thing it does is it is going to create a service in stateful set for the locators. Um, just a few more terms in Kubernetes. So a stateful set is really similar to a deployment in that it uh, contains one or more pods, but unlike a deployment, the pods can have a unique ordering and identity. So it's really useful for stateful applications like the name indicates. And a service is the, just the component that allows all of these things to talk to each other and for apps to talk to the pods. So the controller asks the API to create those things and then the control plane will spin up the, the locator pods that it asks for. And the last part is just the same thing, but for the geode server. So the controller asks for a stateful set and service for the servers and the control plane will create those. So this is the end of this example, but um, I just wanted to illustrate that this is kind of the high level solution that we've taken to deploying Geode on Kubernetes. And I hope that you will see how this kind of addresses some of those challenges we mentioned earlier. Um, we can encode some of the application specific knowledge into the controller um, so that it can do things like deploying the locators before the servers and making sure we upgrade things in the correct order. Um, so um, at this point, we would like to dive into uh, discussing our experience building a Kubernetes operator. And I guess through, through discussing this, we're hoping that everyone will be able to take away some of the solutions that we found and apply them, whether you're building a, uh, an operator or not, 
um, just anyone who's trying to run Geode on Kubernetes could hopefully benefit from some of these uh, experiences that we've had. Yeah, so let's dive into the first one here. That's um, Geode member life cycles and um, preserving data. So uh, as we manage the life cycle of, of Geode, we want to make sure we never lose any data that was put in, uh, into Geode. And so um, the first thing we, we learned about was the Kubernetes expected life cycle versus the Geode uh, life cycle. And uh, it turns out that those life cycles were different. Kubernetes uh, says, hey, I might reschedule a pod that's running at any time. And so uh, as Aaron described before, um, in our case, a pod is running a server or a locator. And so if it's running a server, which it has all our data, um, Kubernetes could just say, oh, I need to move this pod around because um, the amount of RAM I'm using on this particular worker node is is a little too high, and I've got other worker nodes I can distribute this to. So um, what came about was how, how do we prevent this data loss from happening? Well, uh, if you talk to folks familiar with Geo, they would say, well, I've got this thing called restore redundancy, and that makes sure that um, the there are extra copies of the pieces of data in. This is what um, Geode uses. Uh, this idea of redundancy is what Geode uses to make sure that um, you are highly available and that you're not going to lose data when it uh, when when a server crashes or restarts or something. Um, so we actually had some fun fun the first time we uh, got it up and running because we we got data loss on our very first try because uh, we just didn't call restore redundancy between our multiple servers. Um, uh, Aaron can tell you later how excited I was about that. Um, so we went to go add restore redundancy. We were like, okay, the controller can just say, make sure you call restore redundancy uh, before you shut down. Um, but restoring redundancy can take some time and kubernetes uh does not like waiting it's not a very patient uh system so um kubernetes expects you know the containers to be ephemeral and you, know, you can kind of restart them but um you know, geo it's a data store it's got to store that data um so what what could we do what could we do to stop this so um this is where we're going to introduce a new concept uh in kubernetes which are pre-stop hooks and finalizers so a pre-stop hook is called immediately before a container is terminated. And it's synchronous, so it must complete before the call to delete the container can be sent. And so this is important because uh, this is a method for preventing the container that's running um, that Kubernetes wants to move. Uh, uh, it prevents it from, it prevents Kubernetes from destroying that container. And then, um, Finalizers is the, uh, it allows a controller to implement asynchronous pre-delete hooks. So they're basically just arbitrary string values, but when they're present on, um, on, our, on our pod, then they uh, ensure a hard delete of the resource is not possible. So that makes sure this, these are the two concepts that we're gonna use to make sure that um, we couldn't delete in, uh, a, a pod and reschedule it before it was ready. So what does this mean for Geode? So in Geode, we have our pre-stop hook ignore all SIG events until Geode finishes restoring redundancy. So um, an example of this might be we uh, G uh, Kubernetes will very politely send things like SIG term, and we will just say, yeah, I'm going to ignore that for now. Um, I'm still doing my thing. I'm still trying to restore redundancy. Um, so what the pre-stop hook instead watches for is it watches for a finalizer on the server pod to determine the redundancy status. And if it errors, we just hang because um, if we can't restore redundancy, then um, we're probably going to need manual intervention from a, from a human um, who's in charge of this geode cluster that's running. And that can allow them to you know, save off the data somewhere else uh, or whatnot before the pod does. And so um, to actually help that, Kubernetes has this other concept called a uh, termination grace period, which is like, um, hey, after this amount of time, I'm just going to remove everything. You, you took long enough to do this. And in our case, we set it for one year. We hope that's enough time for folks to figure out their hang. Um, 
Um, so great. Let's uh, let's see how we actually know when to add or remove this finalizer. So uh, on server pod creation, and uh, it's not scheduled for deletion, then we set this finalizer. So the finalizer, as I mentioned before, is just kind of a string value. Uh, the example in here is we just have a finalizer called server.finalizer. Um, this is what the pre-stop hook is waiting uh, to be removed. And so uh, let's dive into some diagrams explaining this steps. So we start off with our pod and we say, uh, I'm going to try to delete this pod. And so the first thing we check is we see, is there a running restore redundancy? And so in this particular case, since we just scheduled it for deletion and there's no other identifier saying there's a running uh, restore redundancy, then we're going to schedule a restore redundancy uh, command. So uh, what happens is we ch uh, go use the geo management endpoint uh, and we send a request to say, hey, can you start restoring redundancy? And the return of that output is actually an ID of a uh, uh, the restore redundancy request. And since we mentioned before, restore redundancy can take time. Uh, we're going to save off this ID to check in the future. So at the end of all this, we now have our pod with an annotation that has a restore ID. And in this case, I I don't know why I picked 12, but I picked 12 as our ID here. So our tw uh, 12 is the ID that we got back from uh, um, our restore redundancy command. So great, we've now scheduled and are currently running uh, the restore. So now we need to uh, worry about checking, hey, when am I ready to actually call it done? So now we're in a pod, it's in deletion state, so we're waiting for it to be deleted and it has an annotation for restore ID. And so the next step is we see, oh, I've got a running uh, restore redundancy. Let's go check the status of that restore redundancy. And so um, if the check were to say, hey, I'm still running, then we go back to the first pod in uh, the first uh, section here where we're like, no, nah, nothing's changed. I don't need to schedule a new one. I'm just waiting. Um, so we, we do that for some number of times. And then eventually check restore redundancies will say, hey, restore redundancy is finished. And at that point in time, we now remove the finalizer and the restore ID. And so at this point in time, the finalizer has been removed and our pre-stop hook that was waiting for this finalizer will finally finish. And with the pre-stop hook finished, we will actually uh, run through the regular delete cycle of removing the pod in Kubernetes. And so this is how we determined the uh, efficient way to preserve data during um, server shutdowns. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, so uh, kind of like we alluded to earlier, uh, some ways that the Kubernetes network is different from a traditional network where you might deploy geode is uh, members don't receive the same IP address after they restart. Um, so this was initially a problem because some of the geode clients uh, were kind of aggressively caching locator IP addresses, but there was... Um, this issue was actually fixed by some other geo committers that weren't directly involved with our work. And so that's really great. I'm, I just wanna give a shout out to the open source community for working together on that. Um, another thing is that the DNS cache may be stale. So this is something that you'll have to deal with. Uh, a tip here is to use the locator wait time property on geode to tolerate that DNS delay. Last thing here is that um, sometimes the DNS isn't resolvable until pods are ready. And um, ready in Kubernetes just kind of means like it's the pod is um, up and ready to receive connections. So in Geode, we define that as the Geode member is online, it's joined the distributed system, and it's now ready to accept client connections. So um, a tip here is to use the publish not ready addresses field on the stateful sets and set that to true so that you can actually um, get back the IP addresses 
for the pods from the service uh, before they're actually ready. And then be careful with probes and just know how the, those affect DNS re resolution for services. Let's talk a little bit about containerizing geode. So the first tip here is make sure the geode process is process one in the container. This is really important because process one receives signals from Kubernetes, which is important in geode for graceful shutdown. Also process one standard out is captured as logs in Kubernetes. So the second point here is kind of related to that, but use locator launcher and server launcher instead of GFish to start members. And the GFish, in case you're not familiar, is the command line interface for Geode, and it's normally how you would probably start members. But um, GFish creates um, new processes, which won't be process one in the container. So we found that using the locator launcher and server launcher classes um, are achieve what we need. The last thing here is use a minimal base image. That's kind of just a good practice in general, but it reduces the risk, the security risk, and it's faster since the container is going to be smaller. A couple of notes on configuring Geode. So there are a lot of ways to configure Geode. Uh, one way is GFish, like we just mentioned. There's also this thing called Cache XML. Um, we have REST APIs and JMX. So um, of all these different methods, we found the best method for us was to use the Swagger-based management REST API. And uh, this is because our controller is what's doing, is what's actually configuring Geode. And the controller is a Go application. And so with this tool called Swagger Cogen, we're able to easily generate a Go client and that gives us a strongly typed client. So if something breaks in the API, we can detect that at compile time instead of runtime. And the client also handles all the serialization for us. So we don't have to do things like parsing GFish output ourselves, um, which is nice. Let's talk a little bit about data safety and performance. Um, the main point here is to avoid co-locating cache servers on the same machine. And this is because in Geode, redundancy is achieved by replicating data to multiple cache servers. So if you have cache servers on the same machine, you have a greater chance of losing data if that machine fails. Also, Geode is multi-threaded and it's designed to take advantage of all of a machine's CPU resources. So running multiple servers on the same machine can cause CPU resource contention. The tip here that we found is to use Kubernetes affinity and anti-affinity policies to avoid co-locating the cache servers on the same machine. Okay, um, moving on to persistence and serialization. Um, so one of the tips that we found is that we need to start the Geode members in parallel so that Geode can determine the correct order to recover persistent regions. Um, we, we ran into an issue where we were just using the the default ordered ready policy that the stateful set gives us. And um, yeah, we ran into a problem recovering from uh, persistent regions because uh, Kubernetes wants to start the members one by one, but we actually need to start them in parallel so that they can determine the correct order to recover the data. So the tip here is to use the parallel pod management policy, which is not the default in Kubernetes. And then one more tip here is about PDX serialization. So in Geode, PDX is a serialization format that is commonly used. And if we are using PDX, it should be configured to use a non-default disk store if metadata persistence is enabled. So the team that I was working with developed uh, some APIs that allow creating disk stores and configuring PDX before starting Geode servers. So um, you can take advantage of those APIs if you're doing something similar. So a couple more things here. A uh, quick note about rolling upgrades. Kubernetes actually makes this really easy. Um, the built-in stateful sets perform rolling upgrades in a manner compatible with Geode based on a change to the container image. So doing a ro rolling upgrade, um, once you have everything in place, is basically just 
um, editing a YAML file and changing the container image in that YAML file. And Kubernetes handles the process of um, going through and, re and upgrading the members one by one, starting with the locators and making sure we don't lose data. And that's kind of the advantage that we get from using the Kubernetes operator. So just some tips here, like I said already, make sure the locators finish upgrading before starting upgrading the servers and use probes to ensure each member becomes online before upgrading the next member. Um, observability, so Prometheus is becoming a really widely used format for publishing metrics in cloud native environments and Geode can expose Prometheus scrapable endpoints using a library called Micrometer. This allows easy integration with a variety of tools like uh, Grafana and Wavefront. So the tip here is just to utilize those Prometheus endpoints and in order to integrate with observability tools. The last uh, note about our experiences about development and testing. So I just wanted to describe our testing pyramid. So kind of at the bottom level, we have unit tests, which are testing individual functions and packages in the code. For these, we're using the Ginkgo and GoMega libraries for Go. The next level is the integration tests, which are testing how components interact with each other, but not necessarily the whole system. So in this, in this level, we're utilizing the ENV test package, uh, which is part of the controller runtime library in Kubernetes. And what the, what's really nice about this is that it gives us a partial Kubernetes cluster with just etcd and the API server, which is a really nice way to test our controller. Um, and then the last thing here is system tests. So these are testing the system as a whole, the way a user would do it. And we have a couple different kinds of system tests. Some are deploying a Spring-based Java app, which uses a Geode client and doing operations with that client, even while inject injecting failures into the system. Uh, some other tests are just using the Kubernetes API to configure a Geode cluster and checking the correctness of that. Some notes on CI CD. Uh, our tests are running on every commit against full Kubernetes clusters. And then just wanted to list some of the tools that we use every day here at the bottom. Um, so that concludes the section on building a solution. And uh, to wrap up here, uh, we just wanted to summarize the key takeaways again from this talk. So what we hope you're, you will take away from this uh, first of all, is an awareness of some of the challenges of running Geode on Kubernetes. Um, just like we mentioned earlier, the, the challenges are mainly the specialized knowledge that is required to operate a Geode cluster, the fact that Geode wasn't primarily designed to run in the cloud, and that uh, great care must be taken to run stateful applications. The next thing we hope you'll take away is seeing how the operator pattern helps address some of these challenges. So uh, for example, we, we can encode the specialized knowledge into the controller and um, we can configure Geode in such a way through the controller that it works well in a cloud environment. And then with, with the controller, we can do things to make sure that the um, data is not lost like Michael was describing earlier. So. The last thing is we hope that you'll learn from our experience in building a Geode operator. And um, even if you're not building an operator, just anyone who's trying to run Geode on Kubernetes, we hope that some of these tips that we mentioned will be useful uh, to you. And with that, we'll open it up for questions in the chat. So it looks like we got one. So uh, Alberto starts us off with, uh, when you talk about tests, to what components were you referring to? Um, so let me go back to tests. Um, I Okay, so I'm assuming you're talking about the second part here about integration tests, how multiple components interact with each other. So the, the specific example I can give is testing the controller. So one way we could test the controller is by deploying it to a real Kubernetes cluster with Geode running and 
um, do operations and make sure everything is correct. But the problem with that is that it's really slow um, to spin up a, a Kubernetes cluster, deploy the controller, when we want to run these tests all the time to make sure we're not breaking stuff. So the integration test in this case for the controller is just spinning up a partial Kubernetes cluster with just the components that we actually sort of care about when we're testing the controller, which are etcd, which is a database of Kubernetes, um, the API server, which is the REST API of Kubernetes, and then our controller, of course. So we just spin up those three things and test how those three components interact with each other instead of spinning up a whole Kubernetes cluster. Okay, and then there's a question from Evaristo, which asks, um, did you try to scale out automatically? No, that's a really interesting um, topic though, but we haven't, we haven't gotten to that yet. So we haven't tried to do automatic scaling yet. We still have a few minutes if you uh, want to ask some questions. Um, if you come up with a question later, though, um, don't forget that there's the conference uh, Slack and there's a geo channel in there that um, at least I'm there, but uh, and I think Aaron is there too. So we might uh, mm -hmm. be able to catch you there too if you uh, come up with questions later. Yeah, we can hang out for a little bit longer here in case anybody has more questions. But yeah, we're also, um, our emails are on the first slide and we're, we're both active on the geo dev list. So that'd be another great place to ask questions. Somebody smarter than us can answer it too if we're not able to, so. Um, if you pull up the first slide, Aaron might give people a second chance to grab her sure. emails. But yeah, thanks for taking time this morning to attend everyone. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess we will close the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your conference, folks.